Today we're going to talk about teamwork, and I think that we need to give Amy a round of applause for being so brave as to read all of those hard, difficult names. <laughs> you see, this is not a lesson that we typically use in church. It's not in the, in the usual cycle in the pericopes, but I wanted to, to highlight this morning names that we have not heard very often. You know, who has heard of Tychicus or Aristarchus or Epaphras or Demas or Nympha or Archippus? Those are not names that we recognize. Maybe Onesimus, and we'll talk a little bit more about him. Really, in that whole group, other than Paul, who's writing, and Mark and Luke, we don't know anybody. And there isn't even but one mention to Jesus himself. It's all about the team which so often works behind the scenes. And that's what we want to talk about today, because that really is, is all of us. You know, let's face the fact, most of us, whether in the church or in life, are not going to be the superstar. We're not going to be the one in the limelight. We're not going to be the one that everyone is pointing to. In fact, in church, there is only one superstar, and it's not me. <laughs> and as wonderful as Pastor Bob is, it's not him either. It's Christ. And all that we do and all that we say is all about reaching this community for Christ and for encouraging one another. So we, we are beginning with a man by the name of Tychicus. What do we know about old Tychicus? Not much. Not much at all. Really, the only other place that it talks about him in Scripture is in the book of Ephesians. And we're told by Paul that that he's the carrier of the letter uh, to the churches. So I guess he's a mailman. <laughs> That's who Tychicus is. Other than that, this is what we know. Paul calls him a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Well, back to Tychicus in a minute. I want to tell you a story about something that occurred to me, something that happened a couple of weeks ago. I was out visiting one of our shut-ins, as I often do during the week, and I was at a nursing home. Usually, I go to the private room of the individual. Uh, it's private. It's much quieter. It's, it's a great environment for, for visiting, for, for prayer, uh, for Holy Communion. But in this case, we were in a dining hall, much like this one. About this many people, although most were in wheelchairs or sitting at a table. And I can tell you, they were much louder than you are. Much it was it was very noisy, not a great place to serve the Lord's Supper. But our member was in a wheelchair, and he's 96 years old. He didn't want to wheel all the way back down to his room, so we had communion right there. And while we were about to begin, because it's almost lunchtime, one of the attendants was, was helping feed some of the residents. And there was this elderly gentleman, and the attendant was there. He had a spoonful of, I don't know, mashed potatoes or oatmeal or mush or something, and he, he was giving it to the man, and he took his hand and he slapped it away, and he said, get that out of my face, and I thought, whoa, <laughs> this could be a dangerous place here, well, the man went about his, his work, picked up the spoon and got another one and, and continued the feeding, and then he went on to the next resident. But the attitude was completely different. The result was completely different. As he was feeding the second gentleman, the words to him were, thank you. Thank you for being so nice to me. I'm going to say a special prayer for you tonight. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> How much different from the first man. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to be one of those two someday. <laughs> I hope it's the second one and not the first. But isn't that the question for all of us? How do we treat other people? And it brings us to this point in our notes. We need each other, don't we? All of us, we need each other. Certainly in life, but also as the people of God. Yesterday during our upward devotions, I was talking to the, the crowd that was in the gym and and we made the point again that, that we live life in community. None of us are a solo act. None of us are meant to be alone. From the very beginning, when God created us, 
He said the man is not meant to be alone. All of us need a helper. We all need community. We all need people around us. We also need to accept from each other, don't we? In grace and humility. To be like the second individual in the nursing home. It is hard sometimes to receive help from others, isn't it? I remember when I had cancer, it was the hardest thing. People wanted to help me. I said, no, 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 I can do it all by myself. I'm fine, I'm strong, I'm German. <laughs> we all need each other. And we all need to accept from each other. There's an old saying that goes like this, no one gets into heaven alone. And I know theologically, that's, <laughs> that's not the way it works. We all have to believe on our own, don't we? We have to have a personal faith in Jesus Christ to know that He is the one who is our Lord and Savior. And so my parents can't believe for me. My church can't believe for me. My brother can't have faith for me. It's personal. And yet none of us has built this foundation of faith alone. My parents brought me to church. I had Sunday school teachers who shared the love of Jesus Christ. The day school, where every day I heard that message. And not just in words, but in deeds and activities. All of us have had someone, or a bunch of someones, even this church, that has built that foundation. So that one day, at the end of our life, we too will be with the Lord forever in heaven. Now I know here at Emmanuel we talk a lot about reaching the lost and the least. We talk about for those to come, those who are not yet here, because we know that's our primary mission, to share the gospel with those in the community. And yet our church, I hope, is known even more for the fellowship that we have with one another. That that is how people recognize Emmanuel. Just like in the ancient church when they would say, see how they love each other. That's my prayer for us here at Emmanuel. That we would dare to minister to one another, this fellowship, as if to Christ. Jesus once said here in the book of Matthew, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. And that's my challenge to all of you. But the next time that you see someone in need in this fellowship, that you would treat them in the very same way that you would treat the Lord. That you would ask yourself, if this were Jesus and there was a need, what would I say? Or what would I do? So that this statement would indeed be true, that no single person within the fellowship of this church should ever have a need without having persons around them to seek to meet those needs. My friends, we haven't always done that. And I know that it's not always possible to meet everyone's needs, but we should try, shouldn't we? As if the person were Jesus themselves. Evidently, that is what Tychicus had done. We don't know everything about him. In fact, we know very little, but we we know that Paul calls him a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Because of what he had done for Paul. Paul. Well, let's go on to the next servant here, Onesimus, also called a faithful and dear brother. We know a little bit more about Onesimus. There's a little book there in the Bible between Titus and the book of Hebrews called Philemon. Philemon was a member of the church of the Colossians. Onesimus, however, was a slave, a runaway slave. He had evidently gone to Rome And there he had met Paul in prison. And Paul now calls him not a slave, not someone who should be persecuted, not someone who should be prosecuted, not someone who should be shunned, not 
someone who should be judged, but rather a faithful and dear brother, a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. And he welcomes him with open arms. And then he writes the letter to Philemon and he says, hey, I'm going to send him back to you. But don't treat him like a slave, treat him like a brother. And if he has harmed you in any way whatsoever, I will pay you the restitution. Be reconciled, because that is what brothers and sisters in Christ do. And that's the church, isn't it? I mean, at our best? (laughs) We are a reconciling fellowship. And there is no one out there, or no one in here that we cannot wrap our arms around. I know what's going on in our country these days. You know what's going on. All you have to do is open up your Facebook page, turn on the news, read the newspaper. Now more than ever, this country is divided. We are fractured in so many ways. Even in the church, there is division because of different opinions. My friends, this ought not to be. The church of all places should be a place to welcome, to reconcile, not to judge. Oh, judge ideas. Judge ideas through the lens of the Scripture, not through, not through our own self-righteous opinion. Not through our hypocritical views, but through the lens of the Word of God. Judge ideas, not people. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. How many of you like to be judged? Anybody? No, we know how it hurts. We know how it feels. Just a small example, I can tell you when I was growing up, I went to a small Lutheran school. We had about 125 kids, grades 1 to 8, no kindergarten. I really miss kindergarten. (laughs) In the Lutheran school, everybody got to be in the choir. And everybody... And I love to sing, but I'm not real good at it. (laughs) They even let me be in the choir. But I remember one time, the choir director, he was also the principal, we were standing up on the stage like this in practice, and I was singing my heart out. And he came up to me, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Larry, don't sing so loud. (laughs) But he didn't kick me out of the choir. (laughs) That's the church. That's the church. Where we have that proverbial hand on our shoulder. It's where we have the the warm smile, the embrace, the hug, the open arms for, for no matter who we are or where we have come from or what we have done. That's the church. So ask yourself, Are we here at Emmanuel and are you personally? Are you living a life of hospitality that welcomes others no matter who they are or what they look like or where they've come from or what they've done or even what their opinion is or their values? Even for those like me (laughs) who most certainly missed the mark, at least the note, That's what the church did for Onesimus, a runaway slave who at the time was ostracized as an outcast of society, but welcome in the church. Well, we have time for one more. Justice. We know absolutely nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Except he's mentioned here by Paul. And isn't that amazing? I mean, we know nothing, and yet here he is in this whole litany of disciples. We don't know what he did. Maybe he came to visit Paul in prison. 
Maybe he's a fellow prisoner. It says that he is a member of the, of the circumcised, which means that he's Jewish, which at the time, going to visit Paul or being a friend of Paul puts you at a lot of risk. Paul's in jail. He's going to be executed. That means you could be too. In some way or form, some fashion, he is obedient to Christ. And that's the point. We never know. We never know what obedience to Christ might mean to someone else. What it could mean to your friends, your family, this church, this community. We never know. And yet we continue to serve all of us this church made up of unknown disciples. Unknown maybe to the masses, maybe unknown to the community, but most especially known to God Himself. And so for every Luke or Mark or Paul, there are a thousand, there are ten thousand justices. People who hold one another up Because we're unified and united for one cause. For the Lord Jesus himself. It reminds us that every disciple ought to be celebrated. Every single one, no matter who they are. And that's what we're here to do today. We're going to celebrate this disciple, this redwood. (laughs) Don't you think he looks like a redwood? I mean, I think of that. Growing so tall and so strong and mighty and yet the roots all connected together holding one another up in the forest. Yesterday I had the opportunity to come and and give devotions here for our upward ministry. I'm amazed at how many people are involved in that. Greeters at the door, people running the concessions, coaches, referees, the announcer and those Excited children running out there into the middle of the court, having their name announced, the parents in the stands. At the end of the day, this place didn't look anything like this yesterday. An army of unknown disciples, invisible hands put all the chairs back, swept the floor, made sure the altar and all Things are in place. Our greeters, our ushers, those who make sure we have a bulletin, put the the service on the screen miraculously. The Lord's Supper appears every week. How does that happen? Unknown. (laughs) Disciples. And yet everyone celebrated. I'll close with this, our last line. The ship of the church. You know, in the olden days, the the sanctuary, this room, was called the nave. (laughs) Sounds a lot like navy, doesn't it? And that's what it was. That's what it is. It's a sanctuary. It grants the passengers, which is all, all of God's people, safe passage. Through the oceans, through the storms of life, until we get to the to the final shore of heaven. And what a great image that is. But how about another one? Not a great passenger ship, but rather a fishing boat. No passengers whatsoever, only the crew. All pitching in so that the mission can be accomplished. And that, my friends, is why we are here. Our mission. Not to be the star, not to be the superstar, maybe not even known to the community, but all pitching in together to fulfill the mission, to do the work of our captain, Jesus Christ, to shine his light so the whole world might know him as we already do and to strengthen and encourage one another for the work that God has called us to do. And he granted for Jesus' sake. Amen.